Welcome back to Questing Beast, I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Folk Magic of the Haven Isles. So this is a supplement for old school D&D that adds a lot of uh, flavor and backgrounds and subclasses for your magic users. So by default, magic users are pretty standard and, and pretty uh, vanilla in traditional old school D&D. This adds a lot more variety that you can tack on there. And most of the ideas are taken from uh, traditional magic uh, concepts from England but translated into a more D&D-ish universe. So this includes 14 magic user subclasses, 16 magic user backgrounds, seven tomes or spellbook ideas, 16 magical spells, and four oddities of the Haven Isles. Before we start though, quick shout out to some of our new patrons over on Patreon, including Aiden Downs, Garvin Haslett, Rob Pa, Eco, AKA Francois, Preston Sherman, and Constantine S. Thanks so much for supporting the channel. Let's dig into this and see what we get here. We're also gonna be taking a look at this box of interesting maps created by the same publisher, but we'll look at that as soon as we finish this review. So this was published by Glenn Seal, who did the Midderlands books, but all of the writing was done by Richard Marple. This would fit really well into the Midderlands setting, which is a fantastic version of medieval England, but it would work really well for any D, D setting. We start off at the beginning with some subclasses. So we have, for example, the apple queen or king, which takes a lot of the magic user abilities and framework and then puts it around apples or cider and things related to that. So you can kind of imbue different ciders with magical abilities. Each of these comes with special abilities. Each subclass comes with that and some new spells possibly that you can access. These are found in the back of the book and some flavor that you can add on just to make things a little more interesting. We have a bog chanter. The bog chanters know something of these secrets. Uh, perhaps this magic user learned their craft from a vile hermit slathered in muck or a crazed hag with a taste for live frogs. Maybe they dipped their head into a fetid pool and listened to the mummified souls of ancient chieftains speaking forgotten wisdom. So they're more necromantic in tone. You get transmute rock to mud. And you have some special abilities like Muddy Trail, must roll equal to or under their wisdom score to prevent themselves from leaving muddy hand and footprints on anything they touch. The Brag, a sort of chaotic fae-like background or subclass. The Demon Slave, something more like a Warlock, if you wanted to add those uh, that kind of flavor in there. The fairy bride or bridegroom. I love this stuff. It reminds me more of the type of magic and the conception of elves that you would find in things like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. More folk tales uh, rather than, you know, um, sword and sorcery. And I really like that type of flavor. It's the kind of flavor that we also find in things like Dolmenwood, which is one of my favorites. Some of the rules for the Fairy Bridegroom include things like um, you gain an extra level one spell slot at level one. Fairy Mark, you can always find one of the unfair folk if they wish to. Forever changed, one does not return from the halls of Fairy unmarked. Roll or pick one result from both the improvements and experiences table opposite. So all sorts of strange things could happen to you. So one possible improvement might be uh, rhyming. The Fairy Bride can only speak in rhymes. For pity's sake, make sure everyone around the table is okay with this. Or a dancer. If anyone asks or commands the fairy bride to dance, they are compelled to do so. The fairy bride can make a saving throw to resist this compulsion, but only if they or someone they care about is in danger. And you might have experiences based on your time in fairy, like made to sing for the high court. Can memorize any new song, not spell, by listening to it once. Is driven into a violent rage by the sound of one particular song they were forced to perform hundreds of times over. Green child, kind of swamp creature. You're irradiated. Uh, you have skin the color of fresh peas on account of growing up in gloomium rich environments. Gloomium is a kind of radioactive magical element found in the Midderland setting. This becomes more apparent as their power grows. You can be a hermetic magician. You might have an ability like whenever a hermetic magician encounters a new spell or magic item, roll 1d20, compare it to their level. If the roll is equal to or lower than their level, the Hermetic Magician has heard of this spell or artifact and knows how it works. Doesn't mean that they can cast a spell, they have to be learned and memorized in the usual way. 
What I do like about these subclasses is that there is not really much of an attempt to balance them so that they're all exactly equal in power. Some of these are probably more powerful than others. It's really about getting things that sound cool and would be fun to play. The Masked Dancer. The Peller. Pellers are rural folk magicians, most common in Cornwall and or Kernwall and Devon. They are healers, helpers, cunning folk, weather diviners, and experts in matters of the heart. So a witch bottle. Instead of memorizing a spell, a peller can choose to create a witch bottle of the same level as the spell they have sacrificed. A witch bottle is a defensive war that protects a certain, a specific person from magical harm. The peller takes a bottle and fills it with items that are tied to the target and spends 10 minutes performing rituals over it. Then they bury it. Then it protects them from magic at least once until it is broken. The Sin Eater, this is a fun one. You can devour the sins of others, including things like eating their spells. So if the Sin Eater is within, uh, or anyone, sorry, if the Sin Eater or anyone within their range is targeted by a harmful or hostile spell, the Sin Eater can give up their next full round to eat the spell. That's a great visual. It sounds like that would be a lot of fun to play. Though it can take, uh, you'll take damage while doing so, especially if it's a very powerful spell. The Spay Wife, hailing from a small cluster of islands to the north of Scrotland, the Orcnadians are a hardy people with strong ties to the sea and its powers. The Stitch Witch, if you're really into creating stuff, this is more of a crafting subclass. There's a great ritual in the making of clothes and other items that require stitching. An entire magical tradition has grown up around the craft of leather and cloth. Stitch witches combine a useful trade with their magical powers. So as well as being able to stitch fabric and leather, stitch witches are also capable of stitching materials that cannot usually be stitched together, such, such as wood, bone, uh, lead, and iron plates. The Toad Man. You can become a wizard by um, a long, elaborate ritual involving a frog. You know what this reminded me of? There's a whole ritual right here that's a little bit fun to read. It reminded me of a scene in The Once and Future King where uh, one of the villains uh, decides to become invisible. So she goes through this whole horrifying process of like killing a cat and finding one particular bone and uh, trying to make herself invisible doing that. So I love these long rituals that require you to actually involve yourself with the world, find certain materials, and perform the ritual yourself rather than simply making a role or just saying it happens. A wizard of the edge, these are wizards that are out of time, possibly from the distant past. We have some backgrounds. These don't necessarily add any special abilities. They just add uh, more details. If you want your character to have a little more um, specificity. So you could have been a court astrologer or a cultist, a demonologist, a demonologist or a dwarven shouter, a fallen witch finder, that one sounds fun. A goblin stink binder, a mad hatter, a tempestuous hermit. What is weird about this magic user? You can even add more weirdness on top of that. For ex uh, example, beer dissolves them. Drown them in beer. We have some tomes. So if you want to give your magic users magic books that have a bunch of spells pre-written in them, this adds a lot more uh, interest to that. So it could be what them their angels told Martha. I love a lot of these names. These are just great. So said to hold the wisdom of angels, or at least shining people with wings, who visited an old woman in Hertshire called Martha. They shouted cosmic secrets to her through her front door. She would not let them in. Suggested spells, clairaudience, clairvoyance, ESP, fly, haste, slow, and time stop. And there's a lot of these. These are all great. Some new spells that are tied usually to particular subclasses including things like uh, Cheeky Green, A Stitch in Time, Enforce Queuing, uh, that's a very British thing. Uh, find True Love, I really like this one. You cast it on someone, and then they will very soon afterwards run into the person they were destined to marry. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be in love with them, though. We have things like Locate Thief, Sunset Gold, which is a version of the Bless spell, but with Apple Cider. You can transmute lead to gold. I assume that if you were a hermetic magician, you would be into this. And a few oddities at the back, including a 
mandrake, a robin jade breast, a true lava bread, a wizard hole, and a little glossary. It's a great little book. I love these books that add more magic flavor to your games. So things like Wonder and Wickedness did that, and this seems like uh, something in that vein. Uh, this is the hardback version. I will put links to where you can get the soft cover and the PDF versions down below. Uh, it seems well constructed. It does have the problem that I've seen before with some of these smaller hardback books where it's very stiff, where if you really try and open it up, it really doesn't want to stay open very well, so you have to press down kind of hard. Um, I think that might be due to the, the glued binding, but it doesn't feel flimsy at all. It feels quite sturdy. All right, let's take a quick look at one other product put out by the same publisher, and that is Handy Maps. It comes in this cool little box right here. Um, the person who did these maps, I believe it was Glenn Seal, won an Any Award not too long ago for cartography. So there's a lot of great little maps in here. And it's called Handy Maps. Let's see how handy they actually are. They really come in two different parts. The first stack of maps are all city maps. Uh, here we go. And then this stack down here are all, I think they're building maps. We'll take a look at those in a second. So these are very straightforward. There's really no writing on them. There's no details. Front and back, each one is a different city. Uh, the layout seems of the city seems pretty realistic. It's about what a medieval city would look like. Uh, all the buildings are kind of wedged up against each other with meandering streets. That seems to work quite well. We have some that are fortresses like this one with multiple layers of uh, gates you would have to pass through. Some are simply old uh, villages by streams. The art is very well done. It's very clear and very easy to read. And these are quite detailed. And so they're really not the sort of thing that you would be able to whip up very quickly. So I think they do add value in that sense. It would be nice if there was uh, more specific things built into them, perhaps different buildings that were already labeled or even NPCs you might find there. I think that would take away from the minimalist look a little bit, but it would think I think it would make it a little bit more useful. Uh, my guess is that the author wanted these to be as broadly applicable as possible. So all those things weren't written on there. And there is plenty of room, so you could just make notes and have arrows pointing to different things. I think that would work pretty well. It is a useful stack to have in the sense that your players can go wandering around the world, and whenever they come to a city, you can just whip one of these out and plop it down in front of them, and you'll have you won't run out of these for quite a long time. So you'll have plenty of villages and towns to show them, and it'll feel like the world is a bit more fleshed out. Of course, you'll have to do the work on the cities yourself. And let's look at what we have in our second stack, which is a bunch of different buildings. Some of these include a little dungeon underneath, but very similar to what we saw with the cities. Uh, it's double-sided, and one side is simply the building. So if players are wandering down through a city, right, these combine very well together, and they ask, do they see any interesting buildings? You can just pull out a card and say, yeah, you see that. They want to walk inside, you flip it over to the back, and you immediately have a layout. Again, you would have to add more details to this. What exactly is the building? Who's there? And all of that stuff. Um, but because it doesn't have that on it, it makes it a bit more system neutral. But it does get a lot of that work done for you little dungeon there. We have things like this little, looks like a church. Yeah, even if it has multiple levels or multiple uh, areas, then you get to see all of those. It has some suggested uh, uses over here. This is very SpongeBob-esque. Maybe some sort of weird temple. The River Store Man, so maybe this is down by the docks. Has some more suggested uses and so on and so forth. So we have lots of different kinds of buildings. I'll just flip through these quickly here. Some of them actually have titles over the door, like the Fetid Otter or the White Crow. What's in this thing? Oh, this actually has a number of levels. So it's sort of a little mini dungeon going down perhaps. An art gallery, one of the suggestions. Maybe a wizard tower going up with a basement down here. So this is particularly fun if you're running any sort of city campaign because you can just keep throwing these at the players one after another as they go exploring through the city and they're always going to find something weird there 
And if you put in the work to key the insides of the rooms, you could have a full on uh, living, breathing city up much more quickly than you would be able to do yourself. Stabs meets. So some of these have pretty uh, involved room layouts, while others are pretty simple. Have a little obelisk there. Quite a few inns, which makes sense. Players do like to go to inns a lot. Got a barber shop. And that's about it. It's like a lighthouse at the very end. So these two products um, are rather specific in the way that they are presented and who they are for. But if you are into magic users, as I am, especially in old school D&D, this does make things a lot more interesting and gives players many more options without overwhelming them with feats and things like that. And if you're running any sort of city campaign, these maps seem like a really useful supplement just in terms of making your life easier. All right, as usual, links down below in the description to where you can buy these things for yourselves. And thank you for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.